Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. The topic of today's webinar is Internet of Medical Things. If you're wondering how this new technology is affecting pharma, hospitals and healthcare now and even more in the short future, this is definitely the right webinar for you. The live presentation will run for about 45 minutes and will be followed by a Q&A session. During the presentation, please type your questions in the chat panel so we can answer them. If you have any technical problems during the presentation, please report them via the chat tool or send them directly to webinar at prescalder.com. My name is Sean Cairo and I'll be one of your webinar hosts for today. I am a lead scientist project manager here at Prescalter. My background is in the life sciences and advanced therapies, having conducting research at the University of Lisbon in Portugal, University College London in the UK and MIT in the US before joining Prescalder in 2014. I'll be joined by my colleague Sofian, which uh, will introduce himself now. Thanks, Joao. Hi, everyone. My name is Sofian Bukalfa. I'm also a project architect here at Prescouter. My background is in uh, material science and engineering, and I worked as a business strategy and emerging technologies consultant before joining Prescouter over a year ago. I'm very excited to be here today and to discuss um, the Internet of Things with all of you. Thanks. Thank you, Sofian. So today's presentation, um, before we jump into today's presentation, we'd like to also know a bit more about you. Uh, if you could let us know about yourself by clicking in the poll that you see at this moment. Uh, we will close the poll in around 10 seconds, but we thank you for participating. We'll give you a few more seconds. Okay, this was actually, I think, a poll that we're going to do a bit uh, further ahead, so, um, but we welcome to know that as well. And uh, we're sharing with you now the, the results, what's the greatest roadblock to innovation in your company. Uh, we see that uh, most folks um, seem to go with it takes too much time to research and you can't really find the information to make an informed decision, followed by it's too expensive. So thanks everyone for, uh, for sharing that insight. Uh, you should now also get the other poll that we're mentioning so that we, we learn a bit more about uh, who we have in the audience today. I think we're, we're going to go over that maybe a bit later. Uh, let's move on. Uh, today's uh, presentation is based on the topics that are covered in more detail in the full report compiled by Prescouter uh, specialists, including myself. Um, in addition to that, the report also includes exclusive interviews with industry experts. Uh, if you are interested in obtaining the full electronic version of the report, please email us at uh, aelliot at prescouter.com. Uh, to all webinar attendees, we offer special discounts on the accompanying report at the end of this presentation. Here um, you'll see the um, agenda for today. Uh, before we dive into the fascinating world of Internet of Things, I would like to give you an overview of the pre-scouter process. Uh, it shouldn't really take long. After that, we'll, we'll just have a very brief overview on uh, the impact of IoT before jumping into our Q&A. Uh, with our panel. Finally, we'll have time for questions from the audience. Again, you can type them into the chat box throughout the presentation at any point and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end. So starting with our brief introduction about Prescouter. Helping companies innovate is at the core of Prescouter's mission. In the realm of corporate innovation, companies are constantly on the forefront of solving challenging problems and incorporating new technologies. Prescouter helps companies like yours by providing answers to the most pressing questions, helping solve your innovation goals and reducing your tactical work, allowing you to focus on strategy. To date, we've helped over 300 clients like GE Healthcare, BD and Pfizer to many few in this sector. We do this by providing analysis and insights to understand emerging market opportunities and identifying disruptive technologies like the one we'll be presenting today. To give you an example of how the pre process works, it's as simple as one, two, three. 
On the first step, you start with your question or something you'd like to learn more about. Here we discuss criteria for the people, organizations and technologies you want Prescouter to research. Then, for the second step, Prescouter assembles a team of scholars from our network. The scholars are recruited from leading research institutions worldwide and are all under non-disclosed agreements. They use the combination of their own human intelligence network as well as proprietary software developed at Prescouter to answer your query. With a few short meetings with Prescouter's team, and through interviews and analysis of the information, you receive a deliverable that reflects your innovation needs. On average, our clients find that the report contains around 75 to 80 percent of information that is new and relevant for them, and it allows them to perform informed decisions and, more importantly, take action. Um, if you have any questions regarding how the Prescouter process operates, please feel free to email us at uh, webinar at prescouter.com. Now, I would like you to introduce our guest panelists for today. First, I would like you to meet Alok Tai from Tetra Science. Alok, could you please share a bit more about yourself? Sure. So, uh, my name is Alok Tai. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Tetra Science. My background is about a decade and a half of R&D spanning chemistry and biomaterials and started Tetra Science about two years ago with folks from Harvard and MIT. Uh, we are essentially leveraging the Internet of Things, specifically in R&D labs to enable real-time monitoring, control, quantifying instrument utilization, and also integrating informatics with experimentation. Uh, I'm also the, one of the co-founders of Prescouter, actually, and uh, I'm really excited to join you guys today. Thank you, Alok. Um, I would like now then to introduce you to our other guest panelist, Neil Shepard of Pilotfish. Neil, please share a bit more about yourself with us. Uh, sure. I'm the founder and president of Pilotfish Technology and CEO of its wholly owned subsidiary, Applied Pilotfish Healthcare Integration. Um, I've spent my entire professional career in information technology. Um, prior to founding Pilotfish 15 years ago, I was executive vice president of Computer Sciences Corporation and president of its wholly owned subsidiary, uh, business Process Outsourcing Subsidiary, Alliance One. Thank you, Neil. And before we jump into the questions, I'd just like to give you a general overview of, uh, of this field, the Internet of Medical Things. Um, so this is actually the application of the IoT concept to the healthcare sector in a world where we have an increasingly uh, number of devices and sensors collecting information all around us, IoT promises to unlock the true hidden benefits of these by connecting them to one another and to us, so we can then act to benefit from all the information that's being gathered. The healthcare setting is no exception, as it's perhaps where some of the most sophisticated devices exist, and the ability to access and share the right information in real time can be so important. Right now, the market for IoT within the healthcare is already reaching the 32 billion US dollars. It is expected to continue to grow, reaching more than four times that value by 2021. This value will still be only a fraction of its economic impact. IoT allows to make processes more efficient and generate savings by, for example, allowing for better patient monitoring. It's actually expected that 4 million patients will be remotely monitored by 2020, releasing hospital beds and personnel to the patients that truly require their attention at that time. In total, we're speaking about 650 million devices by 2020 that are waiting to be connected. With that introduction, I'll jump straight into our panel discussion and Sofian will uh, conduct the questions moving forward. Thanks, Joao. I'm very excited to have this conversation today with our two panelists. Um, with that, we'll jump into our first question and we'll address it to Neil first. Um, so, Neil, what do you see as the most transformative aspect that IoT is or will provide within the healthcare sector? Um, at all levels, ranging from the patient, physician, health center, hospital, and pharmaceutical levels? I think, um, I think the most transformative aspect is the ability to access, aggregate, share, and analyze information produced and consumed by the things on the Internet. Um, it's already having a pretty dramatic impact across the entire healthcare value chain. As a background, Pilotfish provides software that enables the integration of any 
thing with any thing um, on the internet. So the internet is the transport for the connection of these things. We do not provide the things themselves. We provide the connectivity, validation, data transformation, routing and delivery of information produced and consumed by things on the internet. Um, so it's estimated that there are uh, going to be about 5.4 billion of these connections by 2020. Um, so obviously more connections than there are devices uh, that will be deployed at that time. But as an integrator of these things on the internet, we've observed a lot of different examples of how the internet of things is impacting the healthcare industry at the patient, physician, health center, hospital, and pharmaceutical level. So some of these include operational efficiency, uh, things like accounting and administration, improved patient care, analytics, including healthcare analytics, predictive analytics, diagnosis and treatment, research and development, uh, population health, remote patient monitoring, health and wellness, and uh, even public health. Thanks, Neil. Um, Alok, would you mind answering the same question? Sure. So, you know, from our perspective, we work a tremendous amount with large pharmaceutical companies, but also other folks in R&D uh, environments. I, I think the areas that we sort of see the most amount of transformation is uh, when one has physical processes like experimentation or preparation or analysis or uh, experimental analysis, when one has physical processes yet with informational related challenges, the Internet of Things becomes a unique solution. And so what we are starting to see is that uh, some of the big transformative aspects relate to, at the base level, operational improvements, as Neil had mentioned. So everything from knowing what capital instrumentation and assets one has and where they're located, to then being able to also change the way that work is done, whether it be leveraging remote capability or by automating the digitization of that work as opposed to by leveraging pen and paper. So for us as a company, what we often do is connect the individual instruments and experiments, in the case of the Pharma Lab, to a single online dashboard such that one can look at operational parameters, as I mentioned, like utilization and location and monitoring status, but then also to execute and use those instruments and those devices um, using a single dashboard. And the last part, I think, is also the collection of that data, instead of it being manually manipulated and transcribed, leveraging APIs, for instance, on the back end to be able to integrate that data that's captured and collected and produced into other informatic systems. So that's how we at Tetra Science are starting to see uh, the role of IoT specifically uh, transform uh, things, at least in the R&D preclinical setting. Absolutely. Thanks, thanks for those insights. Um, we'll jump then to the, to the next question, um, which is a, a three-parter. <clears throat> First, um, what are the th current challenges um, holding back healthcare providers from adopting IoT? And um, in addition to this, which stakeholder is holding back implementation of IoT the most within this sector and how can we convince them to change? Um, Alok, could you mind starting us off on this one? Absolutely. So I'd say the two stakeholders which I think really need to be brought in more in the context of IoT would be the users themselves, whether it's healthcare or scientists in R&D lab. There exists the status quo in terms of how work is done and how uh, data is produced and collected and analyzed. The Internet of Things tends to be fairly disruptive, but also gives you a stepwise change in performance and productivity when leveraged. So as a consequence, I think it's those men and women who are at the bench level or at the uh, patient level, I think, who uh, really need to be brought into the fold and are a key critical stakeholder. Uh, the second part, which uh, I think is also important, is also a regulatory one. Much of the uh, processes that we have when it comes to managing and collecting data from a regulatory and from a regulatory perspective, from a compliance perspective, hasn't really changed in the past uh, 10 to 20 years. So making sure that these new approaches, these new processes, these new, new cloud-based systems uh, that are the backbone of uh, the Internet of Things are also uh, compliant, I think, is also an important part. So I'd say those are the two specific stakeholders, you know, those who are sort of doing the work day to day, and the second is sort of the regulatory and the compliance aspect. Those would be, I think, the two stakeholders that uh, have historically been holding things back, but um, I think have a lot to gain as a consequence. Thanks. And Neil, do you agree with, with Alok, um, or, or do you have any differing opinions? 
Um, no, I'm, I'm very much in agreement. I think uh, one of the reasons, though, why some of those, you know, call them end users, are, it, it's not just the disruptive nature of the technology or, or maintaining the status quo. Um, you know, there are things that are actually preventing them or discouraging, uh, discouraging them from taking advantage. So, you know, I would see challenges including security, the myriad of systems and devices or things that need to be integrated, the tedious nature of configuring and interfacing with the things on the Internet, and compliance with regulatory requirements. So, um, from a security standpoint, once health information is digitized, it becomes much easier to steal. The more information that's distributed or shared, the more points of uh, potential security failures. Uh, there's also the obvious economic impact of the security breaches and the potential for highly sensitive personal data getting posted on the Internet for, for all to see. Um, from the, uh, the standpoint of these this myriad of systems that's out there. Um, there are different devices, applications, medical equipment, uh, wearables, and technologies that have been introduced over time with very different standards, data formats, and communication protocols. So this makes information sharing difficult or impossible without first passing through some sort of mediation or transformation layer before meaningful information can exchange uh, and uh, and take place, so there's there's also the tedious nature of configuring or programming the various things so that they're capable of exchanging information. The things should be simple and intuitive to use so that anyone can use them, you know, prefer, uh, preferably without having to go through a, a detailed installation guide. And uh, and finally, there are regulatory requirements such as HIPAA that make access to health information extremely difficult from an administrative or legal standpoint. And keep in mind there is a huge uh, liability that solution providers can incur if they fail to protect health information from getting into the hands of uh, bad actors. So in, in my experience, the stakeholders that are holding back the implementation the most um, are these large EMR system providers, so electronic medical record system providers where they don't allow third-party solution providers to access their systems. And it's not so much a technical problem, it's a cooperation problem, often the result of the EMR provider wanting to keep competitive advantage uh, by not sharing that, uh, that medical information amongst others. Um, so, you know, how do you convince them that uh, they should change their ways? Well, um, one, one way might be to uh, claw back some of the government benefits that they've gotten, um, such as meaningful use incentives that really require systems to be open and interoperable. You could exact penalties uh, for them not complying, um, or you could even exclude them from government contracts. Um, some of these big EMR providers get huge contracts, and yet they continue to exhibit anti-competitive, anti-information sharing uh, behavior. You know, I, I would hope that in a competitive marketplace, healthcare providers and payers would buy the better, more open systems which would force the incumbents to, to open their systems to stay competitive, um, but was alluded to the, the health care providers and payers tend to find safety in numbers and, and often choose closed legacy systems just because that's what everything else, uh, everyone else is doing and not because it's necessarily the, the better or more open system. Absolutely, and this is definitely a trend we've seen in, in other sectors with, with very similar types of systems. Um, you touched upon some of the, the cybersecurity concerns um, in, in um, your response, and I'd like to, to go back to that for, for our next question, as uh, the safety and security of data and devices are really vital, especially nowadays. Um, we recently had a, a worldwide level cyber attack that in some way took over a network of IoT devices for malicious purposes. In this sector, uh, accessing patient information can have a serious impact on lives, and accessing healthcare smart devices can be deadly. Um, so with that said, how and why should the public trust their data and health um, to the Internet? 
Um, Neil, do you want to start us off on this one? Sure. I, I think the recent attack you're mentioning was a denial of service attack on domain name servers. So domain name servers are responsible for resolving domain names, for example, pilotfishtechnology.com into their associated IP address. So by overwhelming the domain name servers, any company registered with that DNS is out of business until the attack gets repelled. Um, this is a very, very simple way to have an enormous negative impact uh, on internet traffic and is only one of uh, a nearly infinite number of ways to, uh, to do it. So while this didn't have an impact on personal health information or PHI, it does raise the questions about security of things on the internet. Um, so as, as I did mention before, even the simplest devices should be required to have built-in firewalls, password protection, data encryption, uh, while at the same time be easy enough to install and, and use so that, as Geico says, you know, even a, even a caveman can do it. Um, I think taking over medical devices for direct malicious purposes is less likely. For example, turning off an insulin pump. You can't protect against every possibility, just like you couldn't prevent someone from stabbing someone with a scalpel because it was left behind in a patient's room. Um, I can also say from experience that medical devices and equipment require rigorous approval processes from the FDA. Interfaces in particular are defined, fixed, and subjected to rigorous quality assurance. Um, that's one of the reasons why new medical equipment and devices typically take years to get uh, set, uh, certified. I mean, their product introduction or product development cycles are, are um, much, much longer than you would typically see in the software industry. Um, and as far as people trusting their data to the Internet, um, I'm probably in the camp that believes once information is digitized, it's almost impossible to prevent that data from leaking out at some point. And I, I think we've seen evidence of that, uh, certainly during this entire election cycle, as, uh, as an example. Thanks, uh, Neil. Um, and Alok, uh, with regards to the same question in terms of, of cyber security and, and trusting the data to the Internet, um, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I think um, what's happened over the past, you know, five to ten years is a, is a pretty substantial shift in terms of uh, uh, a move from on-premise servers to the cloud, and uh, I think there's definitely a lot of aspects, both in terms of security and encryption, that have actually made the cloud to some extent safer than you would have on your local PC or on your cell phone. Um, but when it comes to uh, IoT specifically, I think what's certainly a value point or something that the entire industry needs to evolve towards is a common set of security standards and expectations. I think that's likely going to be specific from industry to industry or vertical to vertical or use case to use case. But I think what that does is set a common set of expectations such that when you do implement a, a solution, you know right off the bat that, that there will be certain guidelines and, and best practices that are followed. Um, and I think uh, the, the other piece I'd also say is that um, when one who has little training in software and security tends to use these products, that tends to become a, a big gateway or opportunity for such leaks and, and um, attacks to sort of come about. So I think also educating the users in terms of best practices as well and behavioral practices I think is also uh, required here. Thank you. Um, now we'll, we'll go back to, to a um, more general question. Um, what technology do you believe needs to evolve to make IoT easier to, to use and more impactful within this healthcare sector? And what can't we do today with IoT that you would like um, to see happen specifically within that sector? Um, Alok, do you mind starting us off on this one? Sure. So, you know, I think we talked about some of the security aspects and how that needs to evolve, so I won't belabor that point. But directly, I think one of the opportunities that uh, comes to my mind is simply that right now, the simple connectivity as well as the integration, I think, are two areas where evolution needs to occur. In terms of the connectivity, we do have aspects like Ethernet and Wi-Fi and cell networks to be able to connect an individual device to uh, a centralized piece of software or server. However, many of those processes, especially for end users who are not IT professionals, 
uh, tends to be quite problematic and full of friction. So I think that aspect of connectivity and seamlessness uh, needs to exist. Um, the second part uh, coming from uh, our perspective is that uh, I think the evolution also needs to think about how do we take the legacy devices and instruments and uh, systems that are already in place, the physical things, and make it easy to connect those individual existing installed base uh, to a central software platform. When one talks about physical assets, it's very difficult to replace everything with completely new devices and therefore reverse compatibility or supporting legacy installed systems is quite uh, relevant. And so I think making that also easy for end users to do themselves is a, a really critical part. So in summation, I think both the aspect of ease of connectivity of an arbitrary device to a, to a network, but then secondly, also making it easy for an, uh, someone without a tremendous coding experience, for instance, to be able to take an existing device and connect it to uh, an IoT platform, I think is relevant. Absolutely, and, and Neil, as, as CEO of Pilotfish, uh, connectivity is, is exactly where, where your company is, is involved in. Do, do you agree with this? Do you think that's what needs to evolve to make it easier, or, or do you have any different thoughts? Yeah, no, that's, um, that's certainly one of the areas, and, and uh, like I said at the outset, you know, we make, uh, part of our business is connecting anything with anything, and that means uh, really any generation, any device, any application platform, and uh, and so on. Um, so I, I think you know, in terms of the evolution of technology, the uh, much of the core technology is available today, but it it needs to evolve to make it uh, much more usable. Um, you know, again, you shouldn't have to be a, an IT professional uh, to be able to use these things. So they should. Um, you know, things on the internet should have a simple, uh, effective uh, security, easy installation and configuration, uh, simple uh, human, perhaps natural language, artificial intelligence based interface. So you're not programming, you're not configuring. So from a security standpoint, most things require username, password, secret code, IP address, etc. So rather than have 500 passwords written down somewhere, um, replace that with biometric verification. So something that um, can tell by your thumbprint, your voice, a retina scan, uh, the shape of your earlobe, um, you know, who you are and, uh, and provide you access uh, to that device. Um, that would go a long way in, in simplifying things. Um, I think, you know, configuration should be as automatic as possible. You know, where possible, telling the thing what you want it to do should be enough without having to cursor through layers of cryptic menus or, or research it on the web. Um, you know, recently I had an experience where the power went out in the house and I spent about 45 minutes reconfiguring our Nest thermostat. Um, you know, it should not have taken me 45 minutes. And uh, once once the thing it's in, is installed, it should be aware. It should operate either autonomously or with some sort of natural language interface, um, so that you're not constantly going in and and adjusting it. You know, so think about wearables. Think about the Nest or Apple uh, Siri or Amazon's Alexa. Um, you know, this may not apply to the big EMR applications, at least not yet. Um, but one could also argue that EMRs are not yet technically things on the Internet of Things. So, um, uh, and I guess lastly, you know, uh, um, you know we, we provide this integration and I think a lot more could be done on the back end with the me uh, mediation layer too. Um, so organizations have been working for years on developing data standards to enable plug-and-play integration of anything to any other thing. Uh, there are multiple standards, version of standards, implementations of, of those standards. There is also now, as, as we talked about before, uh, a frenzy of activity in and around creating application program interfaces or APIs to simplify the production and consumption of data. But it, it still doesn't solve 
the problem of mediating the differences in data formats, content, and connectivity. And so that still requires this mediation layer. And while there are tools that can dramatically improve the configuration of that mediation or transformation layer, um, I think AI or machine learning could simplify and automate much of that process of mapping format and content between various standards, uh, much in the same way that uh, language translation software learns over time. Um, this is something that, you know, it might be a job for IBM's Watson or uh, Google's DeepMind. Thanks, thanks for those insights. And um, our, our next question has to deal with all of this data that now has to be integrated. Um, we've talked about the numbers of, of different devices that are being connected and how those connections are going to grow exponentially within the next few decades. As physicians have access to more and more of this data, um, how will their role change in terms of their day-to-day -day operations? Will they have to shift towards more of a data scientist type of role or, or will their role stay still um, the same as it is today. Um, Neil, do you want to start us off on, on this one? Sure. Um, there are many types of physicians that serve many different roles and all I think are going to be affected in some way. Um, earlier I mentioned quite a number of areas in the healthcare value chain that are being affected. Uh, some of those that will directly impact the uh, role with a physician include operational efficiency, improved patient care, analytics, remote patient monitoring, health and wellness, and, uh, and public health. Um, so from an operational efficiency standpoint, the seamless integration of things on the internet can greatly reduce the administrative workload of physicians, allowing them to focus on being a, a care provider. Um, physicians today are just drowning in a uh, sea of paperwork. Um, so two specific examples where IoT and access to data could help would be revenue cycle management and claims information exchange. Um, you know, talking about uh, claims information exchange, this is where transactions are sent by the providers to payers, which include insurance companies, health maintenance organizations, preferred provider organizations, or government agencies such as Medicare, Medicaid, et cetera. Um, so improving that process where you need to send it one place and it automatically gets propagated to everywhere it needs to go can have a, a dramatic impact on the bureaucracy and, and uh, paper pushing aspects of it. Um, in terms of improved patient care, um, there's also electronic health information exchange and when it works, um, it can provide instant access to enormous amounts of patient health data, vastly improving speed, quality, safety, and, and cost of patient care. Um, the uh, uh, support services, where um, the entire process of moving patients in and out of hospital rooms is automated, uh, preparing the, the beds, the, the room, um, Patient management, where check-in and check-out can be expedited, uh, when medical histories and personal health information can be accessed from an exchange or from a, a smart card. Uh, we talked about analytics. Um, one of our customers collects data from 600 hospitals, 3,000 practices, performs their own proprietary analytics, and then reports back to the membership uh, the performance of respective physicians. And uh, believe it or not, the physicians actually like participating um, in that process. And so, you know, there's, there's still more. Um, I say I could drill down to any one of these different points, but certainly remote patient monitoring is going to allow virtual house calls and increase the number of patients under a physician's care. Health and wellness is going to keep patients out of the doctor's office and reduce the, the demand for, uh, for patient care. Public health, things like uh, maintaining and updating uh, and immunization registry um, can simplify the process, avoid um, you know, unnecessary immunizations or, and make sure that uh, everybody that needs one is, is actually getting them. Thanks, Neil. Um, Alok, same question. How do you feel the data and the increase in data will affect the role of the physician moving forward? 
Yeah, you know, it's a good question. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have too much expertise on the in, in the medical side. You know, I'll defer to Neil's judgment, but uh, I think from my perspective, the thing that's very interesting is the fact that physicians, uh, as like scientists, when they are interacting and performing their work day to day, the knowledge that they leverage is what's in the in their head at any point in time. Yet the quantity of knowledge in terms of medical knowledge in the case of the physician or say scientific knowledge in the case of the scientist is uh, decades if not centuries uh, uh, deep. And so I think where uh, IoT and the role will evolve is that one can use the historical knowledge and data that's been created in real time and insights on what's happening uh, at that point in time. So I think that's the most really interesting thing and in how I think the role is going to evolve is by leveraging the insights and the historical knowledge um, uh, that physicians or other types of folks never had had uh, at their fingertips. Thanks, Alok. Uh, next, moving on to another important stakeholder within the healthcare sector, uh, medical device manufacturers. Um, as these devices are evolving and getting increased connectivity. How do you think the role of these manufacturers within healthcare will evolve with increased IoT adoption? With increased access to biometric and other data on patients, will they take a closer role in patient monitoring and diagnosis themselves, or will they use the data solely to improve their products and leave the diagnosis to physicians and other healthcare providers? Um, Alok, as CEO of Tetra Science, you've already worked with many uh, device manufacturers, Maybe not as many from the specific medical field, but can you can you share your insights um, from that? Yeah, absolutely. I think you sort of touched upon sort of the way uh, the role will evolve over time when IoT sort of becomes uh, more and more of a critical part. I think initially it will be operational aspects, uh, function, errors, usage, but then will evolve into more value-added applications and analytics of the data that's being provided. I think the most exciting thing uh, is that that transition, I think, will be a multi-year long transition, if not uh, longer than that, in part because historically many of these businesses have uh, sold boxes, if you will, you know, to be very blunt. But more and more the value and the outcome that's being expected is based on data and, in the case of you know, healthcare, patient uh, improvement. So I think what we're going to start seeing is, you know, very simple operational aspects improve by leveraging IoT, but then more shifts towards um, data applications and analytics. Ultimately, I think the most exciting opportunity is, you know, this historical shift away from simple capital equipment models where you pay one time to uh, more of an outcome-based model, whether it be on a per use or uh, maybe enveloped in with the care of the patient themselves. So that's how I sort of see both the technology as well as the business model really evolving. Thanks, Alok. Um, and Neil, uh, same question? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know, honestly. I mean, the term for what you are describing is disintermediation. So this has occurred in many other industries where wholesalers and retailers have been cut out of the distribution chain when manufacturers are able to sell directly to the consumers via the Internet or, or through a single electronic distributor such as Amazon. Um, I don't know that you can necessarily draw the same parallel to healthcare devices. So while the manufacturer might sell the device uh, directly to the patient or consumer, um, diagnosis and treatment seem to me to be a very different specialty with lots of different regulatory requirements. Um, you know, also uh, keep in mind that most of the information uh, is available to everyone at the same time. So it's more a matter of how you put that information to use. Do you, do you use it to improve your product or do you use it to diagnose and treat a patient? So it's, it's really kind of role dependent. Absolutely, and, and only time will really tell us uh, which direction they, they, they plan on, on moving. Um, for the next question, we'd like to, to take a step back. Um, when we usually focus on healthcare, we talk about the impact that it has in the U.S., in Europe, in more uh, developed nations. How do you think IoT will improve healthcare in developing countries um, all around the world? Uh, Neil, do you want to start us off on this one? Sure. I think in a word, dramatically, 
So most developing countries have already leapfrogged the legacy telecommunications infrastructure that we've had to deal with and move directly to cellular, which gives them widespread access to the internet and therefore IoT. Um, their healthcare systems may lag far behind in many cases and the ratio of doctors to patients is often extremely low. Um, however, they also don't have the red tape, they don't have the regulatory issues to deal with typical of more developed nations. So when the alternative is death, I think the risk tolerance level for treatment is a lot higher. That means that many of the more innovative IoT solutions will find their way into the market much faster. Uh, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. So, so two big ones um, are telehealth and remote patient monitoring. Telehealth is going to improve the number of patients that a doctor can see without requiring travel to remote locations. So a doctor could sit uh, in his or her office here in the U.S. and serve a patient in Liberia. Um, remote patient monitoring is particularly good for tracking disease. An interesting example is something that's called sensor technology and analytics to monitor predict and protect uh, Ebola patients, or STAMP2 for short. Um, this collects patient data including ECG, heart rate, oxygen saturation, body temperature, respiratory rate, and position. And the thing is just a patch that is worn by the patient and collects the information then leverages all the other advantages of IoT on the back end uh, to enable the analysis, prediction, tracking, and so forth. Thanks, Neil. Um, Alok, same question. Sure. You know, I don't know if I have a, too much uh, more to add other than I think the most exciting thing from my perspective is that uh, in developing countries, oftentimes some of the larger cities uh, have a, a large collection of uh, medical talent and expertise, yet there exists a large geographic distribution of the population. And so being able to leverage IoT and connectivity to be able to source the talent and the knowledge from different geographic areas in terms of uh, local or dis uh, dispersed sort of population needs, I think is the most exciting from my perspective. Thanks, Luke. Um, next, we'd like to shift to uh, the pharmaceutical value chain. IoT is set to impact the entire value chain uh, in pharmaceuticals from R&D to clinical trials, manufacturing, uh, etc. Do you envision any difficulties in adapting and coordinating such a tremendous change across an entire industry and within various business units of, of these uh, large companies? Um, Alok, you want to start off on this one? Yeah, absolutely. I think what's, what we're starting to see in terms of uh, uh, the pharmaceutical industry and whether it's you know, all the way from the R&D scale all the way through sort of manufacturing, at least the preclinical context, is that there are very specific pains that, are, that people are experiencing day in, day out, whether it's uh, uh, expensive servicing contracts and capital equipment or whether it's um, you know, data that need, they need to be capturing in a compliant way to report to the FDA. So I think in those cases, the adoption of IoT will actually be a need to have as opposed to a nice to have and will actually be driven by business demand. Um, I, I think the transformation I don't think will be uh, night and day or, or black and white. I think it will be um, a steady set of point solutions that are developed to solve specific problems, but then hopefully will evolve more into an ecosystem in which uh, the disparate manufacturers of devices, software, and also the people involved will all get connected via IoT. Thanks. Um, and, and Neil, same, same question. Do you envision any difficulties in, in terms of the coordination and adoption across the entire industry? Yeah, first, first of all, let me say I agree completely with what was first said um, the, uh, or just said. The funny thing about IoT is that it is not centrally managed or coordinated. Um, the reason why it's projected that there are going to be 5.4 billion IoT endpoints by 2020 is because of the market-driven innovation that is taking place across all industries, including healthcare. So it's demand pull rather than mandated push. Um, that being said, there is clearly a need for laws, regulations, standards, and certifications. 
So many of these things are smart replacements for dumb appliances, you know, light bulbs, microwaves, and TVs all have stringent, stringent standards and certifications so they don't catch fire, burn, or electrocute you. Um, similarly, standards and certifications should be applied to these internet medical things. Uh, the value of collecting, accessing, and using the vast amounts of information available is going to drive the demand and usage uh, for IoT. And each, you know, is what, what was just said is for each new application or device of IoT that's released, new regulations, new certifications uh, may be required as, as the industry evolves. Thanks, Neil. For our final uh, question today, um, we'd like to ask your thoughts on uh, your vision for the future of healthcare, and specifically how IoT will integrate with that change and make that change happen. Um, Alok, do you want to give us your vision um, first? Sure. Um, you know, I think uh, the way I would describe the vision for the future is uh, seamless connection across the disparate groups. Um, there exists a lot of uh, relevance as to what a patient experiences to uh, what compound was manufactured, how it was made, and how it was discovered as well. And I think having better visibility and connection across that entire you know, soup to nuts uh, um, uh, production to, to value, I think, is going to be where IoT is really going to create the most amount of opportunity. I, I think the, the, the analogy I often use is that if one looks at what the Bloomberg terminal has done for finance, uh, I think we're going to start seeing the same thing in terms of healthcare where, uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago, stocks were traded based basically with folks in blue lab coats who walked around a desk with pink slips. Um, now it's uh, a guy or a gal sitting in front of six computer screens with all the individual data streams coming in real time and sort of executing trades uh, effectively. I think we're going to start seeing that same sort of transition in terms of both efficiency, visibility, as well as capability um, because of all those connected disparate parts. Absolutely. Um, and Neil, uh, same question. What is your vision of the future of healthcare with IoT? Yeah, I, uh, I would agree with the points just made. Um, there is you know, just a, a tremendous growth in the amount of data that is available uh, for analysis, tremendous growth in the number of tools that, uh, that are available to do that analysis, you know, whether it's impacting, as we talked about before, um, the efficiency or the effectiveness of medical care. Um, and I, I think, you know, one of the areas that is is really going to have the greatest impact is when you take all that information from all of those disparate systems um, and you make it available uh, for what for a uh, uh, essentially a human natural language AI based interface. So whatever your uh, particular discipline is or your role is. Um, I think having that information available to you and, and your ability to query and use that information, interacting almost as you would interacting um, with an albeit extremely intelligent and knowledgeable uh, human being. So, um, and, and I don't actually think we're, we're that far away um, from that really happening. Thanks, Neil. Um, so, regarding the topic at hand, there, there's still a lot to learn. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind uh, all the people in our audience that we do have a report on the Internet of Things that Pre Scouter has written and that is just uh, available for publication. It will discuss not only IoT's impact on the healthcare sector, but also its impact on the manufacturing, retail, and smart home sectors. So, if you'd like to learn more about IoT and its impact in these various sectors, do not hesitate in contact us to obtain the full report. Um, both PilotFish and Tetra Science are featured in the report if you'd like to um, get some more insights on both of these companies. We'll also be sending out an email with all of this information along with a survey uh, following the completion um, of this webinar. So we hope uh, that you enjoyed the presentation today. Uh, next, I'll go over a few questions that the audience um, sent out while we were having the discussion today. Um, the first question um, will be addressed to, towards uh, Alok. Um, so with the multitude of wearable devices that are available, 
are there any standards we can use um, to source activity data? Yeah, you know, I think you sort of, uh, whoever asked that question touched upon one of the key critical words here in this context, which is standards. Um, in terms of wearables, uh, I know there are some companies out there that can pull in data from disparate um, uh, wearables technologies like Fitbits, etc. Um, I'd imagine there are no standards explicitly, but likely back-end APIs for their cloud software platforms that you can pull the data from. Um, you know, on the scientific uh, side, uh, in terms of experimentation, there is a, a foundation called the Allotrope Foundation looking to establish standards for uh, data produced by uh, you know, clinical and scientific instruments. But in terms of wearables at the moment, no, I think there are no standards in part because I think it's still a nascent field. Uh, standards often emerges when there's one, a robust ecosystem, but then two, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of uh, maturity in that, organ in that uh, discipline as well, which I think hasn't existed yet. Thanks. And uh, Neil, do you want to add anything to that um, regarding uh, the standards for wearables? Sure. Um, the, you know, I think from a, a wearables perspective, again, there's, um, there, there has not been a well defined standard for communication of that information and to, and to some extent there is even a prevention of sharing that information. Um, again, you get into regulatory issues, liability issues and so forth. But generally, if you can get information from one of these wearable uh, devices, if you can expose that data um, there are tools available, you know, in fact, my company uh, offers uh, a solution to where you can establish connectivity, you can transform the data um, from whatever its proprietary format is into whatever format it needs to be in uh, to be consumed by, you know, whether it's a database or another system or so forth. Um, and, and it's going to keep changing uh, over time. Each time somebody comes out with a new, wera uh, new wearable or different data that's being uh, captured and uh, produced out of that, um, there's going to be an impact on uh, the standards, the data format, and, and even the communication protocols used for that. Thanks. Um, our second question is regarding uh, EHRs, electronic health records. Uh, the question is, given the plethora of different EHRs, how do you reconcile the different data sets and different data types collected from these various and, and different platforms? Um, Neil, do you want to start us off on this one? Sure. My answer to this is fairly similar to the, to the wearables, um, and that is, uh, yeah, absolutely, there are a whole bunch of different EHRs, I think, you know, as many as 600 are deployed out in the marketplace, and they have various data formats. They store things different way, different databases, different programming languages, different file formats, and, and so forth. Um, but essentially, you can break it down into specific stages. So one is to be able to connect to that EHR. Um, so there are a wide variety of connection types that you can have. Um, and, and like I say, there are tools available that will allow you to support any of the uh, plethora of connection types um, to that, whether it's to a database, whether it's to an MQQ, whether it's to pick up a flat file, etc. Um, you know, secondly, uh, you need the ability to go through and validate and scrub that information and make sure it's it's good, clean data. Um, you know, third you need to be able to take that data and transform it into some sort of common rep, uh, representation. So in our example, we'll take that data and we'll turn it into generic XML. Regardless of what format it was in, we turn it into XML, then we transform it into whatever data format it needs to be transformed into so that it can be consumed to the, by the target system. Um, another technique we use is a canonical where you transform that data to a single view of the data and then from that view into whatever uh, format is needed to be consumed by the, uh, like the, the end user, the target um, system. And so you can basically configure an assembly line that will allow you to connect any system, any data, any format, any protocol to any other system data format 
uh, or or protocol and do it on you know a seamless real time basis. So you can do it. Believe it or not, there uh, there are tools out there uh, that that can help you. They say integrate any any EMR with any other system. Thanks, Neil. Um, definitely seems like it would bring a lot of value to, to all these disparate um, EHRs uh, to provide that uh, feature. Um, Alok, do you want to share any insights uh, on this question as well, uh, on reconciling different data sets and, and data types uh, coming from the different uh, EHRs? Uh, you know, I actually don't know if I have uh, too many insights on the EHR side. I think, uh, as Neil pointed out, there's, I think, a lot of similarities in terms of the challenge when it comes to whether it's uh, EHR systems or wearables, etc. Thanks, Luke. Um, looks like we have one more question here from the audience, um, and uh, we'll go right back to you, Luke, on this one. Um, how do you deal with barriers to adoption due to the various levels of technical literacy among uh, the different healthcare providers? Or is that directed at me? Yes, yes, look. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, sure. yeah, no problem. No, I think it's a, you know, as we sort of discussed during the Q&A, there, there uh, exists right now an, uh, an adoption of IoT or implementation of IoT where you have to be a, an IT professional or a software engineer in order to uh, use, create, and find value out of the system. Uh, I think it's really very much uh, important for uh, providers uh, to be thinking about how they make that user experience more solution-oriented. Um, but then at the same time, which is, you know, the tension, also create more of a platform than a system. You know, I've had the IT directors for several large pharmaceutical companies tell me that they're done investing in systems and instead want to invest in platforms because they want the ability to be able to customize, manipulate, uh, contribute their own ideas and applications to it. So, you know, I think um, a, a part of it is uh, product and how it's designed. But then the second part, I think, also is... Um, providing keys to the kingdom for the internal teams within those customer bases to create their own solutions as well. Thanks, Alok. Uh, and, and Neil, um, any other thoughts regarding this? Yeah, I would, I would really sum it up in, in, I think, a single sentence, and that is it is incumb incumbent on the solution providers to make their solutions as simple as possible so that you don't have to be uh, you know an IT professional or deeply technical to use the products. Thanks Neil. Um, and with this, um, this concludes uh, the questions um, that we'll be going over uh, today. I'd like to once again thanks um, everyone, um, our panelists, uh, Alok Tai and Neil Shepard from Tetra Science and Pilot Fish, um, our audience, um, as well as the as Amanda Elliott who helped organize the webinar. Thanks everyone.